Welcome to the Tanked Podcast. In this week's episode, Olivia Alanger reads from her piece The Fantastic Real, which considers the role sci-fi fantasy literature has played in her art practice. In 2001, I fell nearly 7 meters into a crevasse and broke my back. The following year, I was diagnosed with compound autoimmune disorders that took me out of school during large swaths of my early adolescence. In memory, that time was spent being shuttled between doctor's offices, testing out alternative treatments, and generally feeling like shit. On top of all of it, I suffered from garden variety teen issues social anxiety, dysmorphia, and an all-encompassing obsession with and terror of the future. The future, and my ideas of it, were shaped by my bedside reading. I read compulsively whilst homesick, and loved stories of distant lands, different physics, and alternative realities. I read almost any story that took me out from under the weight of the banal and very non-magical reality that is illness. Being sick, changed how I navigated the world. Sci-fi fantasy literature, SFF, remains a favorite coping mechanism for when I'm feeling lost or stuck in the quotidian. SFF requires that its readers project into a space where the laws dictating our world no longer apply, and therefore liberates the storyteller from the pressure of relying on facticity. Fantastic realism was coined by literary scholar Alison Waller, to describe how SFF contests realism by showing things not how they are, but how they are not. By making the impossible possible, SFF acts as a pedagogical tool, raising the visibility of non-normative identities, highlighting what is seen as weak, odd, or neurodivergent, and reframing these qualities as extraordinary, or even at times, supernatural. During winter 2021, Locked in a small of Manhattan apartment during the Omicron surge, I came across a new SFF novel, Raika Aoki's Light from Uncommon Stars. New York winters can feel oppressive, the sun barely peeking out from behind skyscrapers, the wind harshly stinging bare skin. Reading Aoki's book, which features a supernatural demon, a donut-making alien family, a galactic war, and artificial intelligence, immediately brought me back to the liberation I felt reading SFF during my adolescence. The story follows Katrina Wynn, a trans femme violin prodigy and runaway who finds safe haven with violin instructor Shizuka Satomi. Unbeknownst to Katrina, Satomi has made a deal with the devil for Katrina's soul. She is initially resolved to fulfill her Faustian bargain, but by the end of the story would rather burn in hell than sacrifice Katrina. As Aoki put it to me over Zoom last autumn, In life, there are many, many different ways to be a hero. In a media landscape dominated by variations of Joseph Campbell's hero's journey narratives, Katrina is anything but. She is tormented both at home and in the world because of her gender identity and flees the Bay Area for Los Angeles. Katrina is so fearful after a lifetime of abuse that she accepts maltreatment more readily than love. Under the tutelage of Satomi and within the safety of her home, Katrina begins to blossom, finding not only a place where her gender identity is accepted, it's soul Satomi is after in the end, not boys or girls, Aoki clarify, but also a place to refine and define her innate skills and talents. By developing a sense of self-love in the face of adversity and a passion for self-expression, Katrina saves herself. Teenagehood is equated with exploration and discovery, despite teenagers having limited agency and less experience. The concept of the teenager, however, is a relatively recent marketing construction. As children's author Natalie Babbitt wrote in 1972, it made its first appearance during the Second World War and was created partly by parents, partly by manufacturers, and partly by Frank Sinatra. With this nascent category, a cohesive sector for commercial extraction was created. Stories for television and film began to be produced to make profit for teenage allowances and free time. One genre that especially took hold was SFF, its emphasis on world building ripe for this angsty age group. 
Today, SFF and young adult fiction, YA, can seem interchangeable, and oftentimes SFF will feature a teenage protagonist or be told from the teenage perspective. However, to many practitioners of the genre, SFF need not be relegated to a specific audience. Indeed, it can be viewed as a pedagogical tool to contest the codes of adulthood by questioning them. Looking beyond the teenager as a marketing construction, the experience of adolescence is not bound by a diurnal turn. Without an access mundi of identity, there is a malleability around selfhood itself. Adolescence, like magic, is an experience of transformation. It is a state of constant change. Post-structuralist notions of identity suggest that at all stages of life, selfhood is plural, fluid, and fragmented. In many ways, we are constantly moving through what might be seen as states of adolescence. Aoki describes navigating her aging mother's cognitive decline. My mother is, in a sense, an adolescent to her changed ability, and, as her child, I am an adolescent in my experience of being a caretaker. We oscillate throughout our lives, cycling from fledgling, working towards some sense of mastery, and then beginning anew as experience and time bring us into narratives that we haven't yet experienced for ourselves. Aoki believes that identity is less determined by age than it is by experience. A fresh experience renders us at a new beginning, and we must learn and reinvent our roles. Transforming adolescence into a lifelong experience would mean remaining in a state of continual becoming. For French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan, fantasy lies at the very heart of subjectivity. The only true alternative to fantasy is psychosis. In studying psychosis, Lacan became concerned not with a reality with which a subject or patient might have fallen out of touch, but rather what seeped in to take its place. In this way, subjectivity is defined less by whom we think ourselves to be, and more so by how we perceive ourselves within the world. When we experience new stages of adolescence, it means occupying the position of other on an interior level, which may feel in opposition to our adult projection of self. As Mark Fisher describes in Capitalist Realism, if the real is unbearable, any reality we construct must be a tissue of inconsistencies. It is within these inconsistencies that space for SFF can percolate. World building is intrinsic to child's play. SFF is therefore often derided as being less emotionally complex than other genres due to its relationship to youth. By doing so, however, critics presuppose that children, particularly teenagers, do not face the same problems as adults, but new technology, war, and climate chaos encroach upon us all. Long dead are the days of SFF being read only by nerds with neckbeards. And as the readership has shifted, so too have demands for narratives that don't require cultural transposition. As a result, SFF literature has become increasingly non-Western, non-white, and non-heteronormative. SFF allows for the kind of storytelling that can elaborate on and extrapolate from the increasingly bizarre reality we hold in common. When you find those whose perspectives resemble your own, a community can be built. As an anti-authoritarian genre, SFF is an especially participatory culture where shared interest in the not yet rather than what is is valued. Self-selected families that contest the idea of a nuclear family are erected within readership as much as within the storytelling, even if they reproduce the burdens and traumas found within genetic relations. Cosplay, fan fiction, Reddit boards, and WordPress accounts are active places for kinship within the SFF community, where people who feel displaced in their world can find a virtual home of their own. All unhappy families are unhappy in their own way, even the ones we construct. However, the experience, especially for those who do not feel safe or seen, of having support along the journey of self-invention is invaluable. News stories alter how we relate to ourselves and to others. In Light from Uncommon Stars, Satomi, acting as a kind of surrogate to Katrina, exists outside of the traditional trope of a mother figure as either devourer or nurturer. Aoki describes how Satomi, in essence, loses everything but keeps everything. This is the kind of storytelling you get when you have queer writers, when you have writers of color, people who have dealt with and have no illusions about being nurturing. 
because sometimes we have to just say ourselves as well. I want to reject the idea that stories need to be binary, that one character or person has to die for another to live. Aoki embraces a both-and structure for her characters that incorporates multidimensionality and resists binary frameworks. There is no neat bow tying up each plot. Rather, the reader believes that the characters within Light from Uncommon Stars, Satomi included, have the ability to chart the course of their next chapter. In the end, Satomi doesn't give in to her Faustian bargain, but is instead saved by her would-be victim, Katrina, who helps her escape an eternity in hell by fleeing for outer space. Readers want to see different ways of conflict resolution, Aoki told me, where, for example, an antagonist isn't vanquished but is allowed to process loss and to be potentially identified with. In addition to being the year of my fall, 2001 was also the year of my first kiss and, in some ways, the beginning of my art practice. While recovering, SFF literature was, and continues to be, a tool for learning about and actively reshaping a world that can so often feel static and unchangeable. It also provided me with the blueprint for building worlds of my own through art making. During this time, I made collages by cutting up old National Geographics, Vogue magazines, and Better Homes and Gardens, mixing in images from my personal collection of Absolute Vodka and Got Milk advertisements. I had binders full of them, to create images of creatures promoting made-up products. A favorite comes to mind, a polar bear with Charlize Theron's legs and strappy black high heels pushing a lawnmower over a desert landscape. The headline screamed, so sexy, so chic. By attempting to make the known into something new, I too cycle through states of adolescence, frequently learning new materials, techniques, and approaches to art making. While there are more overt ways in which my predilection to SFF plays out in my practice, magical creatures, monstrous eyes and tongues, a play about enchanted objects, the genre really taught me how to think of reality as fluid, a space between what I can see and what is yet to exist. By building impossible architectures and shifting scale, I'm able to engage with SFF and make manifest my wonderland-like fears of the future. As Ursula Le Guin writes in her essay about SFF, the carrier bag theory of fiction, it is a strange realism, but it is a strange reality. What I believe Le Guin meant, as do writers like Aoki who are defining contemporary SFF, is that the genre allows us to process the surreal intangibilities of our shared lived existence while inventing possible futures. Not that any literature per se can solve the problems of our current existence, but SFF can teach us how to cope better by shifting our perspectives. Aoki's novel may read as fantastic in terms of its settings and conditions, yet the core narrative mirrors the multifariousness of life as much as, or even more so than, stories bound by sophisticated or antiquated notions of realism from the 19th and 20th centuries. What Light from Uncommon Stars does, and more broadly SFF does, is to propose that there are alternate pathways for relating to one another. In this sense, as we encounter different stages of adolescence, we construct nebulous and neoteric constellations of community across cultures and realities that allow us to queer our futures and make space for increasingly complex corporealities. To hear more podcasts from Tank, you can subscribe on all major podcast platforms or follow us on SoundCloud. The theme music for this podcast is by Himera.